gentlemen, I'd like to call the order of the City Commission meeting for Monday, April 17th, 2017, and ask City Clerk please call the roll. Commissioner Alcantara. Here. Commissioner Bradford. Here. Commissioner Herzberg. Here. Commissioner Honaker. Here. Commissioner Sukup. He's excused. Commissioner, sorry, Vice Mayor Nobick. Here. Mayor Masarzik. Here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Commissioner Alcantara for the invocation, the pledge, and then the singing of our national anthem. Commissioner. Let us all please rise and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing all of us to get here safely, dear God. For those that are on the way, God, we ask that you give them the same mercy, Father. God, as we're about to enter this meeting, I ask that harmony and peace be in the place, dear God. I also ask, God, that you give the leaders of this community sitting on this dais, God, the love, compassion, and most importantly, the wisdom needed to move this community forward. Also, God, Commissioner Bradford's father, who's in the hospital, God, I ask you to comfort him and be by his side and her family's side, dear God. And if it is your will that he be healed, God, may your will be done. All these blessings and many more we ask in your precious name. Amen. 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 Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now to sing the Pledge of Allegiance, we have Discovery Elementary Chorus, uh, led by their teacher, Brittany Rath. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Discovery Elementary. Great job. Commissioner's next item on the agenda is our regular City Commission meeting minutes approval for April 3rd, 2017. Uh, I guess it bears comments that uh, several comments were made about some uh, verbiage in our minutes, nothing uh, uh, more of a administrative function, uh, full names instead of just commissioner so-and-so, and staff's gonna look into making that change to our automatic system, the Granica system we use. Uh, but with that, if there's any corrections, additions, or deletions tonight's minutes, say something. If not, motion's in order. So moved. Properly moved by Commissioner Hertzberg. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Bradford. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we have a great part of the meeting tonight. We're gonna go down on the floor, commissioners, and we're gonna try to pass out a few eager awards for some graduating students and some further education students here tonight. Uh, that city, the William, Scott, William Harvey Scholarship Fund uh, Award Certificates. Uh, no cash, guys, don't get your hopes up. You're not getting any cash. You're getting a pretty certificate, though. The money will come later. And we have a process here where we, we, uh, we con you know, you contact your schools when you enroll and the money goes into your account, the school and all. But if Commissioner would be so kind as to join me on the floor, we'll call these out.
I put them in order, yes. You put them in order. Well, yeah. Yeah. I know, but the reason you got to bounce around all night. Okay. Our first recipients will be receiving a $1,000 scholarship award. Our first recipient is Galaris Garcia Milan, Daytona State College. Our next recipient is David Globensky, University of Florida Gainesville. Our next recipient is Esmeralda Irizarry, Deltona High School. Our next recipient is Ashley Kizilowitz, sorry, Pine Ridge High School. Our next recipient is Ashton Langrick. Our next recipient is Josephine Menino. <laughs> Deltona High School, by the way. Our next recipient is Nicole Garcia Milan, Deltona High School. Our next recipient is Valerie Nadu, Florida State University. Our next recipient, Alexandra Resto Castro, Daytona State College. Our next recipient, John Reyes, Deltona High School. Our next recipient is Alina Rodriguez, Trinity Christian Academy. Our next recipient is Isabella Santiago, Deltona High School. Our next recipient is Brandon Schaefer, Pine Ridge High School. <laughs> Our next recipient is Jordan Shastin, Trinity Christian Academy. Our next recipient is Seth Smith of Florida Gulf Coast University. Oh, well. Our next recipient is Leah Thomas, University of Central Florida. Next recipient is Ransley's Torres Rios, Deltona High School. Our next recipient is Fongvo, Deltona High School.
Our next recipients will be receiving $1,500 scholarship awards. Our first recipient is Christina Glazelle, University of Central Florida. Our next recipient is James Hecker from Trinity Christian Academy. Our next recipient is James Ivanov, University High School. Our next recipient will be receiving a $2,000 scholarship award. And our recipient is Annalise Alicia, Trinity Christian Academy. recipient will be receiving a $2,500 scholarship and our next recipient is Michael Ivanov of the University High School. Next recipient will be receiving a $3,000 scholarship, and that recipient is Matthew Hansen of Pine Ridge High School. just want to take a minute and, and congratulate all of y'all. That was a great job. And these two other uh, young people that didn't make it here tonight, we'll make sure that we get these to them in the mail. And uh, you'll be all be contacted by the city with the instructions if you haven't received them already on how this all works. But uh, congratulations. Keep up the good work. You made us proud. And they can say what they want about our city, but boy, we put out some good work here in sports and academics too. And I, I really appreciate all the work y'all are doing. Keep it up and uh, 
Teachers, principals, stand up. These guys help a lot. I, yeah, there you go. These, and I, I know the young people enjoy you coming out to support them and their, their achievements, so thanks an awful lot. Take care. Where am I? I'm not going over there. I'm going back over to Dyes. And we'll just take about a two minute break and let the auditorium clear and then we'll move on with our meeting. Uh, it's really great to see, and it's a scattering of students this year that are currently enrolled that have finally, we're getting the word out now that they're available. And so some of the students that are already enrolled in college are now being able to apply and help them as they continue. That was one of the problems we had in the very beginning was uh, getting the word out, so the word's starting to get out there that there's uh, money available for continuing their educational pursuits too, so that was real nice to see tonight. And several of the students, uh, well, the one mother was here for her, her son who was in, in college and couldn't get away for this evening's awards, but uh, was sure that they'll get that stuff in. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, our quarterly reports on city advisory committees, uh, parks and recreation advisory committee, there's written reports available if anyone wants them. Scholarship advisory board is a written report also, but we just saw the fruits of their labor, so that's been done. Affordable housing is written, and the ordinance review committee is a written report. Uh, I don't have any special commission reports. Uh, Commissioner Hertzberg, did you have anything tonight? You were- I, I do, I, okay. I do, Mayor. Just a quick update on the team Volusia. We just actually had a, um, board meeting prior to this, and that's why I missed the agenda review. Um, so the Team, team Volusia um, Economic Development um, Commission, we had our board of directors meeting today, and we actually have um, really a new logo, which I think is going to be very, very successful for Team Volusia and marketing the area. And um, the, the name is still obviously going to be Team Volusia Economic Development Corporation, but the marketing is going to target the region, which I think is a wise thing in terms of name recognition. Um, very few people around the country with, or even within Florida know where Volusia is or even how to pronounce it correctly. So, you know, to market the, Day the greater Daytona region and, and have a point of reference is really, really important when you're trying to bring in businesses. And so they, um, we, I'm also a member of the Strategy for Success Task Force and we met uh, last week, or two weeks ago, I'm sorry, and I did a phone conference when I was out of town as well and we're really working on um, developing the strategy that Atlas Marketing um, pretty much said that we need. We had two outside groups come in to look at the region, look at Volusia County, and see what's really needed to bring and attract more businesses here. So Team Volusia is um, really looking at implementing a new marketing strategy, and thanks to Jerry Mays, our Economic Development Administrator, for always being a part of Team Volusia and being there. So that's it on that report. Okay, thank you. Any questions by members of commission? Hearing that, we'll move on. The next item on the agenda is a public forum uh, for items not on the agenda tonight. Do we have people that sign up to speak? Leslie Golden. Your name and address, please, Leslie. I think your mic is off. There's a little button there. Okay. There you go. All right, now we can hear you. All right. My name is Leslie Golden. I am a, a business owner, co-owner of Air Current Incorporated. We are located in Deltona on Providence Boulevard. We've been serving our beautiful city of Deltona for 18 years. Um, we have some credibilities. We've been an A-plus rated business with the Better Business Bureau for 18 full years. Um, we hire a third party to do all of our reviews. We have 160 reviews on our website if you'd like to read any of those. Um, I highly recommend maybe even using them for your building department to get great feedback and hold them accountable. We have been in your community and very involved. 
We, my husband and I, taught t-ball at Van Park when our boys were young, grew them up through there, and then went on to mentor teens for 10 years in a teen program, keeping the kids off the streets of Deltona. Um, we are a part of our community, and we pride ourselves on our business and taking good care of our customers. We do business in the HVAC, heating, air conditioning, and ventilation. We install service brands such as Train, Root, Carrier, and Lennox, some of your top models that you'll know and, and have heard of. We do work for three Lowe's in our area. We are very creditable. We do business starting from Orlando. We come down the I-4 corridor. We Altamont, Longwood, Castleberry, um, Winter Park, Lake Mary, Sanford, DeBerry, Orange City, DeLand, Deltona, and then we go on past that to over the bridge to Lake County, and then out to Daytona and Port Orange. We have one, of um, our installers are all been trained by us to do the way that we like our installs done, so we pretty much cookie cut, cutter them the same in every county and every city. Um, there are some times where you have to implement and adjust because it's just common sense because some of the homes in Deltona have Mackle homes and they're in tight fitting places. The units are just getting bigger and bigger. And um, we have to try to work with the building department to try to accommodate these homes with new equipment. Um, unfortunately, in 18 years, this building department has found every way possible to fail us for the most minute things um, we've had to tippy toe around trying to be over friendly, um, to try to, you know, tell us exactly how you want this. Um, then we would get it just exactly how we thought they would want it. And then lo and behold, they'd be off on a different tangent and we would get notif no notification and we'd just start failing again. So then, so then we'd have to try to readjust, making our customers upset. Um, uh, when we go off to the contractors' conventions and we meet up with other contractors, we're very friendly with our competitors, believe it or not. They'll say things like, I can't believe you have to work in Deltona and how do you do it? And we're not gonna be going there, so why don't you go ahead and take some of our customers because we will not do work in that city. I do have three letters that three people were not able to make it and they sent saying why they will not do work in your city. We just need your help to try to help us to um, make your department more contractor friendly. I, I don't know that if, I don't know why we hadn't come to you guys sooner, but I'm going to tell you that it's been 18 years. We are not difficult people. We have tried and tried to work with this department, and it's been nothing but one thing after another. So please hear me today, and at least investigate it or listen to what we have to say. All right, thank you, um, commissioners. If you allow me, Leslie, uh, Ms. Golden, uh, we, we had had a meeting. And I do want to let you know that I did bring that issue up with Volusia County. They've already put the ball in the rolling to get that unified code committee back up that VCOG, it, it was disbanded when VCOG stopped, ceased to exist. They agreed. So that is that is in the works right now. It'll be a, a countywide program again. And they may include Flagler too because there was some discussion about Volusia Flagler on some issues. I'm not sure about that yet, but uh, they are they are contacting other cities for input. So, and what does that board do? I'm not familiar with it. Well, the Unified Code Committee was a committee that was established years ago under VCOG. When they met, when there was disputes about an install, and I don't want to get into that because I'm not a, I'm not a contractor that understands all that. But but that committee's going. We'll let you know when we find that out. As I promise you, if we find out more about it, we'll let you all know so you can attend those meetings. Okay, it's a it's a it's a group of contractors and and uh, inspectors that get together and, and talk about how the codes are being enforced in different cities. Uh, Jane, Mayor, if I can also make a comment. Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, I also want to let you know, Leslie, and also to your group that I have reached out to other city managers within this area. Also tried to ask them as what is their position. More. I know that you sent me a list of questions, and so I forwarded our response, staff's response, and for their input to make sure whether they were consistent or whether or not we had any discrepancies. I've already heard from one municipality so far, but when I get more information, I'll provide that to you. I want to let you know is that 
Um, we appreciate you meeting with us and we want to work with you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Hertzberg, we normally don't do this on public participation, but tonight was important because we did have the meeting and wanted you to know that I did bring it up that meeting in Daytona and Sunder. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and, and again, normally I don't like to respond back, but I know there's a group of you here. We hear your concerns, at least I've emailed back and forth with some people regarding this and the unified code committee is a good idea. The, the county and all the municipalities need to be on the same page with not only this county, but the surrounding counties, because as you stated, you do business in several different areas. And, and I'm hoping that, and I know in the past there have been issues in terms of being able to, to pay your permit online, to pay, to do other things and not have to come into the city to pay things. And I think we're working on that, but um, even through the League of Cities, we were talking about getting back together and making sure we've done it with the film industry to have a unified permitting for anybody County. that wants to come in here and do that business. And, it, and understand from my point of view, and, I, and, and I've had your company at my house, I understand my father was a small air conditioning and heating contractor, and it is very, very difficult to go from municipality to municipality and have different rules and different regulations that are not uniform. And if, and if Volusia County wants to, to be prosperous and to keep good businesses, that we all need to do that. The fire code should be the same. All the things should be relatively uniform so that when you cross boundaries, and, and I welcome, for me, I wish that we could do a group, like you said, Mayor, with the contractors, even with, why don't we do That's that with our doing. West Volusia we're, we're Regional doing. Chamber, with our West Volu our, our summit, maybe that needs to be a topic for all of our West Volusia right, well, cities. We're getting, we're getting way off of I know, but they deserve but, an answer. Yeah, but They're that's being concern. set up right now, and I don't know exactly the format that they'll eventually set up. So, okay, let's move on. Uh, Thomas McGuire. My name's, my name's Thomas McGuire. I'm president of Flair Air Conditioning. We've been in business for 50 years. Uh, we're out of Port Orange, Florida. Uh, years ago, we used to do work in Deltona, uh, and it got to a point that we were failing jobs on minute, technical, little tiny issues that would never occur in any of the cities we do work with. We do the installs exactly the same over here as we did there, but they would find nitpicking things to fail us on. So. The cost of coming back, the cost of the reinspection adds up. And it's not just your $35, whatever it was for the reinspection. It's sending a crew or a man over here to correct that little issue. Uh, and, and my labor cost rates, you know, it's, they're over $60 an hour to put a man in a truck with the overhead and everything. So it just became unaffordable to keep doing business over here. I know of uh, three of the contractors in my area. I was talking to one Friday night. Same exact reason, he will not, he used to do work, well, he does work in Orlando, Seminole and everything. He says, I won't go to Deltona at all. And he does multifamilies and everything. And he says, I just, I don't want to deal with the issues over there. So that's where we're at. Uh, one of the big issues I just want to talk about, I think you've seen it in the questions that were sent out. It's, it's really ironic. We work on, on air conditioners every day. They have high voltage, they have low voltage, okay? We're working on the high voltage side, we're working on the low voltage side. Yet, legally, we cannot change, go into the breaker panel and change a breaker. Uh, I can check a breaker, I can go into the breaker panel and make sure that the uh, screws are tight on the wire feeding out, but legally I'm not allowed to change that breaker. But the homeowner owner can go down to Lowe's Depot, buy that same breaker, they have no license, nothing, they're able to go into that panel and change that breaker legally, where I cannot. Now, when the, rules on the codes were written, I feel that the strong electrical union set up the writings the way they did to keep their job security because, believe it or not, we know how to wire control voltage where they can't. I mean, they come to us, we don't know how to, we, we do jobs, we don't know how to do the control, you guys take care of it, we don't understand it. So, I mean, that's one of the big issues I find very ironic. And, and the other thing, when we're dealing with uh, what they're talking about now, having a licensed electrician on a job before you can change the job and get the inspection and start it up. And in the summertime, when a customer's down, a customer's down, okay? That's a life safety issue. I don't care what you say. You got an 80 year old, 70, I don't care who it is. You don't want to be without air. They don't want to be without air. So they're forcing us to jump through these hoops to get these permits, not me, because I don't do work here, but these other people over here. And I mean, the customer is number one. And I think, I don't think you want to be uh, known as a city 
the Belks, their customers, or their, their, you know, their, their people that live there keep charging them for this and charging them for that. Do you get an electrician to come out? Oh, it's only a $35 permit fee. Not for the electrician, it's another $150 for him to come out and change a breaker. So now that, that fee just went from whatever it was, you know, another $185, whatever. So that's just my main concern. That's, that's my input. Thank you. You Thank were you. at the other meeting, weren't you? Yeah. You were at the other meeting. Yeah. I've learned more about breakers than I ever wanted to know, but uh, I, I'm getting there. Okay. Richard Von Brocken. Good evening. My name's Richard Von Brocken. Uh, I own a company named Von Air. Uh, we're at 1738 State Avenue in Holly Hill. Uh, my father formed our company in Deltona in 1968 in the construction compound for Mackle Brothers. I like to say that we are the original air conditioning contractor of Deltona. Uh, first of all, one thing I'd like to say, and uh, unfortunately the students have left, congratulations to all of them. Something that I hope you are all aware of, Deltona High School now has an academy for construction technology. Not all students are college bound, and we need a work workforce. The fastest growing workforce in the country right now is in the trades. So hopefully that you are all aware of that and support that. Uh, the instructor, I believe, is Keith Wallace. Um, I also want to thank you for the meeting last week. We had some 15 contractors there. I counted no less than six second generation con contractors. Probably five to 600 years of experience between us. I know we gave you some code issues and some questions, but I don't think that that was the entire gist of the meeting. Uh, with that kind of experience, I don't think we have any problem whatsoever, and I think Mr. Rowland will agree. We can debate the code. We know the code. Mr. McGuire and I, with our fathers, when the Florida Energy Code was written, we attended every public meeting statewide. There's no like, lack of knowledge on this side of the table. Uh, Tom spoke that a lot of contractors don't want to work in Deltona. I don't have that luxury. Uh, I can literally say that probably the majority of the new homes in Deltona from 1968 till 1982, I did, or my family did. My customer base is too big to walk away from. I say that uh, we have that experience. We, we don't have a problem with code issues so long as we're not aiming at a moving target. And it seems with Deltona, we're always aiming at a moving target. A perfect example of that I cited in the meeting with you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I had a contractor recently contact your building department requesting information on what documentation was required to permit a new home. Uh, your building official explained to him what was required. He noted that that was not on your forms nor on your website. And according to him, the comment was, well, it will be there tomorrow. I don't know that that's the way to be business friendly. I don't know that that's the way that you want your department run. Uh, that's certainly your decision to make. I will tell you that um, I thought it was a very productive meeting, but I think the overall point may have been missed, and that is that Sometimes it would appear from our side of the table that your department plays loose with the rules as it applies to them, uh, particularly with some of the information that came out when we met 12 years ago. Uh, but they play a lot more strict when the rules apply to us. And that is why we are here. And we wanted the commission, the entire commission, to know about it. Because when we met 12 years ago, quite frankly, we met with then the city manager and virtually nothing changed. So we thank you for your time and we hope that you hear our message. All right, thank you. R.W. Kicklider. First of all, thank you all for listening to us. Uh, I like Mr. Von Brocklin and Mr. McGuire, I'm a second generation in this industry. Uh, I've been doing this close to 40 years. I work, I am no longer contracting, I'm a consultant, I work with a lot of these guys. 
I work in approximately 20 counties uh, across the state. This is one of the few building jurisdictions that has requirements other ones don't. Uh, I recommend to my clients that if they're going to bid a job in your city, that they add five to $700 to the cost of the job just to cover their expenses of handling the comebacks on minor uh, issues that the building department finds. Also, it's one of the few cities that requires things that are not in the building code uh, for one and two family dwellings, such as a uh, duct design and layout. It's not required. Uh, also, on the changing of uh, disconnects, uh, anybody knows, electric knows that the load side of a disconnect starts where it comes out of the main panel. And a, if there's a secondary breaker or disconnect at the unit, it's just the same as changing a light switch. Um, I just wish we could get everybody on the same page. Several years ago, I was at one of the Florida Building Code Commission meetings. One of the commissioners stood up and said, we have a beautiful, wonderful, state unified building code. The only problem is we have 693 interpretations of every line. And what happens is from building, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, the code is interpreted different according to how the inspector looks at it, how the plans reviewer looks at it. And it's, it makes it very rough for these gentlemen to make a living because every place they go, it's different. And that was not the intent of the legislature or the Florida Building Code Commission when they sp spent many, many hours putting together these fine codes. And once again, thank you all for listening to us. Thank you, Mr. Kicklider. Can you give us your address and, and that for the record? Because Yes, sir, 140 South Grandview Avenue, Daytona Beach. Thank you, sir. Curran Golden. Hello, Kern Golden, Air Kern Incorporated, office at 1650 Providence Boulevard. Um, thanks again to the manager and mayor for meeting with us and the commissioners for meeting with us this time. Um, like my wife Leslie said, I started this business in 1998 right here in Deltona off a of Blaine Circle. And when the county operated the building department, I had no issues. As soon as Deltona became a city and started their own building department, it has just been one issue after another with the building department. As soon as you think you have one thing solved, they're off onto another thing. And as soon as you think you've got that one solved, it's off onto another thing. And it just came to a point where I just had enough. And the first incident is I've been doing it uh, like everybody else, we do the same work, same job, same install everywhere else. I was told specifically by Steve Rowland, by your building department, how to put in, what disconnects to use. I can use my circuit breakers in my heater kits because like Richard said, you have homes in here from the 60s and early 70s. Well, they have Zensco, Federal Pacific, stab block breakers, which you can no longer get. So it's just a matter of common sense that you're gonna make a homeowner pay $1,200 to $2,000 to upgrade a panel when all I can do is put a circuit breaker in my heater, which has been approved, which they told me to do, which is approved by the manufacturers, which comes shipped from the manufacturers with the correct size breakers in them to use. My, their response was, well, put a disconnect where, in the hallway. I mean, you know some of these homes on, from the Mackle homes are little tiny closets. Once I put that upgraded high sear unit in, there's no space. So where am I gonna put that disconnect? In the hallway, am I gonna walk by, I'm gonna hit it with my head. I, it, I'm just asking for common sense. That, that's it, there's, there's just, this building department has no common sense. And so we've gone through the, all these years of doing it that way, using our disconnects with our circuit breakers in them. Then come August, October of 2016, well, now that's no good. I can't use the circuit breaker in the heater anymore. I can't use my disconnect with my circuit breaker in the disconnect anymore which I was told by the building department and Mr. Steve Rowland that I could perfectly well do that and have been doing that and Steve Rowland had passed, I don't know how many he's passed over the last 12, 15 years of doing his inspections that way. And so when I go talk to Steve about it, 
nothing get done, I get a call from the inspector. My answer from the inspector and tried to explain to him in the code what we have, no. Go back to Steve, talk to Steve again, I get a call from the building, I get a call from the inspector again. I don't get a call from Mr. Rowland, I get a call from the inspector. The answer is still no. Go down, meet with Steve, still nothing. Uh, and it just one thing, then it went from, I met with my commissioner, Mr. Alcantara, then the building department found out. Well, now I went from the breakers, disconnects, to now all of a sudden, I've got a water leak. That's not even in the code book, I can't even fail for a water leak. But yet, I paid my $30 reinspect fee because my homeowner was trying to list his house to sell it and he can't have an open permit out. So there's retribution, and that's, I'm afraid that's what's gonna happen to some of us here once we leave, that it's just you're gonna get even worse. So I've gone from that to complained again to Mr. Alcantara. Now, I can't even change out a disconnect box, a whip, all I can do is unhook and rehook. So I'm asking y'all, where, where do we go? I mean, this, my business is here, I've been here, I've got thousands of customers in Deltona, I do over 200 in installs a year in this city. I have to add more money to do the jobs here because I know I'm going back, I'm gonna fail. And you can go back and look, everyone that the city of Deltona has inspected, I failed. Everyone that your universal inspection has done, I passed. I don't, I don't know, it's, it's just an inconsistent building department, it's very frustrating, you can't work with them. And Thank you, Mr. It, Golden. it needs to be changed. We're, we're gonna Thank work you. on that, yep. Next. Tim Haynes. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners and mayor. My name is Tim Haynes. I live at 273 Fisher Drive in Deltona. I have been here for uh, almost as long as the mayor. Just we, about. Uh, I haven't seen met. you in ages. We met in the early 80s when I moved here and built a house. And I'm a financial advisor, so I work with a lot of these small business owners. And it really concerned me when I sat down and I was speaking with the Mr. and Mrs. Golden, and they were explaining what they what they were experiencing because it reminded me of about eight to 10 years ago when I was heading up a building project for Cornerstone Christian Church, and we ran into the same problems here with the city of Deltona building department to the point where we actually hired an attorney out of Orlando to come and meet with the city manager, the building department director, and the mayor at that time, I believe was Dennis Mulder. And we were prepared to file a lawsuit against the city because of the inordinate amount of strange request and things that we were being put through just to get zoning done, to get permits, to try to even start our project. And it became such a horrendous nightmare that that church ended up abandoning the building project, sold the property because we were required to do things that no other city had ever even thought of for a church building. And that was a, that was a building that was gonna be almost a $2 million project when it was all completed on 24 acres. So it really disturbed me when I heard the same kind of building department mechanics going on, the, uh, the same processes, the, the same attitude. And my, my call to the city commissioners would be that uh, there needs to be some, some changing that needs to go on in your building department. Perhaps it is time to shuffle the deck, so to speak. Uh, maybe it's time to bring in someone from outside and to put some <coughs> fresh faces in there. Um, because right now, this has become such a business unfriendly environment in Deltona. I talk with, with countless business owners and they have no interest in locating inside the city of Deltona, and they really have no interest in doing business in the city of Deltona. And after 30 plus years living in this community, that saddens me tremendously. Uh, I just cannot see how the commission could not be aware of some of these concerns that have been ongoing for years and years and years. I know commission members change, but there's several of you who have been involved in this commission for, for multiple years. 
And Mayor, you've been here since the beginning of this city formation, which was about 1995. And uh, it, there are times that I think back and reflect to that point in time and wonder if I really made the best decision in voting for the approval of a city <coughs> formation and whether we should have stayed as a county entity. So I look for your help, all right? Thank all right, you. Thank you. Bart Famosa. Hello, Mayor, Commissioners, Assistant Mayor. Give us your name and address, please, Mark. Mark Formoso, 851 Arlene Drive, Deltona. Um, I'm coming tonight because we have a special situation. We, we've got a, can, we can't hear you because you'll have to, you're too tall for our, our mic. Maybe put it up on the top there or something. Okay. Um, we have a special situation um, where we live. Um, my father's been here since 1980. Uh, we had an Italian restaurant. We have a large Italian family that lives here. We uh, have built homes since 1983. Um, mm. We've been in the area a long time as well. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. I don't like public speaking, so. Um, where we live, um, we have, my father had built his house on two pieces of property. The lot behind it is where my brother lives, and because it's a catty corner, lot kind of weird situation on the other back yard I had lived. Um, there was a piece of commercial property, it's three commercial lots that were, I believe, 50 by 170, 50 by 170, and 60 by 170. So all together, I believe, um, it's like 160, it might be a little bit more by 170. So it's a really big piece of property that's on the corner of East Furwood and- By the church. And El Camp, right across from Trinity. Assembly of God. Anyway, we have a code violation because um, it just so worked out. I don't know if God has plans for us or whatnot, but um, the property was w working really good for us um, because we have a non-emergency transport company called First Care Transport. Um, we park vans over there, and over the years, we've grown from one van, two vans, now we have eight vans. Um, it's been it's been there 10 years. We've had problems um, in the past with the city of code violations because there was a second entrance that when they paved from the gravel road to the asphalt, there was a, a side. Then they asked me to uh, put bushes there so that wasn't used. So we've done that, we've complied. There's a 25 foot buffer that hides it. And even when Mark Gibson came to hand out me the uh, code violations, uh, he said, I drive by here all the time and I've never noticed. So we keep everything well hidden. Um, we have a couple of code violations, one being that we have too many vehicles parked on the property. I'm asking for your help. I need to find out how we can work together. Um, we have five different houses. I can kind of disperse everything around, right on LCAM and Furwood. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be pretty. Um, or I can try and find out how we can use this unique piece of property. Um, nobody's complaining at all. I don't, I really don't know what the complaint call that came in. I have a feeling it was a disgruntled business competitor. Um, I also have a um, temporary, uh, I don't know if it's called a pole barn or whatever. I, co I cover a 20 foot foot, uh, 25 foot boat. And as far as I know, because there's no concrete set in it, it's not, permanent, so I thought I was okay putting it on the property, um, but apparently they say that I need to pull a permit. So I need to find out, you know, I need to, I need guidance. I wanna do things the right way. Um, we're growing in the, in the city. The hospitals love us. We uh, are used primarily by Halifax Hospice, Florida Hospital Hospice, VITAS Hospice. We're used by all the Florida hospitals to do their own transportation that they call us to do. Um, so we have a very good, um, you know, recommendation and we try and do the best we can. Okay, you're running out of time, but yep. yeah, you need to get a, get a hold of the building department and find out 
And that's kind of a unique thing that's commercial down that one section. It was commercial. Plus those three on the corner. Yeah. Yeah, is where I, I, I use Joe in a greatest respect for your dad, but that's dad's house in the back and then yes. up front, okay. Uh, yeah, check with our building department. If there's a issue of something built out of it, you'll have to apply for a permit and get it I just inspected. want to see if there's a way I can get a special variance because it's not well, a that, unique Well, they'll situation. tell you. They'll give you all the information. I don't want to, from the dais, tell you, but yeah, they'll, they'll explain all that. How you Will you guys it. be able to help me? Uh, well, we personally can't. You'll have to find out what the rules are for it, but yeah, we'll, they'll, they'll get you on the right path. Okay, thank you. Okay. Pat Gibson. Hi, Pat Gibson, uh, 230 Cortland Boulevard. Did all you guys receive my email today? Fraud complaint on the roof, falsification of building permit. Sent it out to every one of you with links to the Florida Building Code. My roof um, that Mr. Rowland passed, it actually passed in 2010. I found out the shingles were high nailed. I called back. I had a reinspection done, which Lee Grosner came out and failed the roof. It was not installed per manufacturer specifications. This is her handwritten receipt, okay? She failed it, gave me this after I showed her the product data, the, the building code, and how those things were supposed to be installed. She was the only inspector that got on the roof. Six months later, while I went through litigation with this guy, Steve Rowland came back out to my house with Lee Grosner, no corrections were ever made two years later, and passed it from the ground again. A building permit is only good for 180 days. That is falsification of a building permit. That is a criminal act, sir. I've stood up here time and time again with you and read off the code, I've given you copies and links to the codes, and you guys have done nothing. What have you done to change it, John? You have my fraud complaint in hand. It was emailed to you this morning, sir. Okay, go ahead and finish your comments. Well, I'm asking you, did you do anything about it? I don't do There's anything about it. There's a video on YouTube. Ma'am, staff does that. We set policy. I don't get involved in those kind of illegal items. Here's the letter from Tampco stating that my shingles were not installed for manufacturer specifications after your building department passed it from the ground. The code states that basically you will do a four-part minimum inspection. Mr. Rowland states that he can determine the timing of the inspections and what is to be inspected at the sequence of those inspections. They determine that you need a four-part minimum in-progress inspection. The city of Deltona is not doing that. I showed it, it's on a YouTube video that has 150 views right now if you go to the city of Deltona YouTube. I sent you a copy of that also. That was in the email. It went out to every commission, it went out to the city manager, and you guys have done nothing. For seven years, you've walked around from the ground, signing off on permits, never, never checking the nail pattern of shingles or checking the drip edge up there. I have the proof right here. I have pictures of it. I have letters from the manufacturer. They both, I have the certified Volusia County transcripts that they testified that they do not do that inspection, which is required by the Florida Building Code, Section 110. Jacksonville pulled this up. They actually have a destructive called in progress. If an in progress inspection is not done, they will come back and tear that roof apart, and you have to show all the material with all the product data, all the product data sheets, manufacturer sheets, shingles, underlayment, et cetera, have it on there when the guy shows up and they'll tear that roof apart to make sure it's done correctly. You don't even list it. For six years, you didn't even list the product data code on your building permits. You have no idea what shingles, what manufacturers up there, nothing if you had to go back and inspect these houses. How can you inspect a roof by not getting on it? They state the risk manager won't allow them to get on the roof. In the Florida statutes, it states only a, an, a, an unlicensed individual cannot stop a licensed individual from doing their job. I asked for the risk manager's occupational license. I have a certified copy. They don't have one. 
Well, Ma'am, your time is up. As uh, the the only historical information I had is you, this, this is was sent to the news station. Ma'am, I'm speaking now. I didn't interrupt you, but this has gone to court, right? And you lost in court over this issue at this the roof. The city of Deltona's testimony was thrown out because they had two conflicting statements. Then you need to file charges of perjury on on, on some of these statements. On your building inspector and your guys? Yes, I will. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay. I did have a question, Mayor. Is this one of those cases that would go before that board if they had a, if she could take this before the, that board that, once it's- That's a policy board. No, this is a, that's a complaint. Okay. Okay. No, I had a roof oh, yes. redone Sir, again, and they did the up. same exact thing six years later, here, and they've done been, it to every house around here. You've been here many, here. many times. Your time is up. Please take a seat. Your Who's next? Up. Pardon me? Your time is up. Not yet. I got a year and a half. Brandy White. Brandy White, Trauma Street. First, I didn't get a chance uh, at the last meeting. Mitch, I think you came up with some great thoughts, and I didn't get a chance to, to say anything about that, so I wanted to say that now. Uh, you, Anita, and Heidi, all three of you. Brandy, you um, have to direct your comments, you, you know, to the chair, and but you could, in your comments, you can do that, but. Okay, I just okay. wanted to say that I appreciate uh, the, the forethought that I saw coming forward and the questions that we had actually being asked. Um, I actually had, a whole three minute spiel about my meeting uh, with our new event manager. But um, I, uh, I'm gonna touch on that later instead because today I actually attended a uh, funeral. Deltona resident, 21 years young, hit by a car, walking. I just want to give her a tissue, please. You want to take I'm good. I just want to know if we have not made plans to put a sidewalk, Catalina, Lake Helen Osteen Road area, on Lake Helen Osteen Road. I know Catalina has been done. Oh, thanks. Um, but Lake Helen Osteen Road at that intersection. There's a lot of people that walk to work. I've actually given rides to people who work at the gas, uh, the uh, car wash. I see them walking early in the mornings. I'm like, you know, if they have the dedication to get up an hour early and walk to the work, and I'm passing by, I'll stop and give them a lift. There are people who don't have cars. Uh, a lot of these were the younger, uh, they were about 20, the, the guy that I picked up, and he didn't have a car yet. He was working at this job to afford a car. He walks that road every day. There are a lot of people that walk that Lake Helen Osteen Road, and, and my concern is we were here several meetings ago fighting with residents who didn't want it in their neighborhood. And then we're talking just a neighborhood. They said they weren't in schools, things like that. We're talking about a main intersection and there's still no sidewalks there, but we're trying to tear up people's yard and irrigation to put it in these little back neighborhoods. I just wanna bring up the concern that there is still no sidewalk on Lake Helen Osteen Road by Catalina and it's a very dangerous section and there's no yards to tear up people's yards. So I don't understand why that hasn't been a focus before people's yards and neighborhoods. So, with that said, uh, the only other thing I wanna bring up uh, regarding my meeting with Chris, in which I, I will probably uh, wanna have some meetings with a few of you about this, uh, I had con some concerns over his resume. Um, I don't know how the vetting went, uh, but I did some research myself, and there's some inconsistencies on his resume. Um, in speaking to him, I think there's some either confusion on the outlook of what this community center was supposed to be versus what it seems like it's turning into be. It seems like the city is going to try to run a business uh, versus running a community center. And so we're a little concerned that the things that we thought were going to happen and, and what this community center was gonna be used for is actually not what's taking place. Um, and like I said, there, there's a, I have a lot of questions and I had three minutes worth of things, but I didn't feel that that was particularly important. Uh, but bringing up the sidewalk issue on Lake Helen Osteen Road uh, took precedent tonight for me. Um, so uh, again, I will reach out to you guys regarding my, my concerns, um, but I suggest that each one of you take a check on that resume and uh, do the research yourself. I, I think it won't be long before you see what I see. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Uh, Commissioner Hershberg. 
Thank you, Mayor. And just in response to, um, <coughs> Really quick, not response, just a comment. Mr. McGuire, I used Flair for a long time, and you don't come into the city anymore, so, um, I mean, I know, I, I know you're Terry and so forth from years ago, so that's, that that's, um, I just wanna say that that's the last time I called, they don't, they don't come here for the most part anymore, and that makes me sad, because they were always a good company, the relationship I had with them, and you're, you're current, you're great, but you know what I mean, it's just, I understand your plight, and um, I'm really angry. I'm really angry. Okay. And I'm angry because, I'm not gonna point the finger at anyone or anything, it has to change. This city has a reputation over and over and over again. We had DRCs in the past that you had to go, you went, you corrected one thing, you went back, then it was you had to go do another thing and another thing, and Mr. Denny changed that. He changed that culture back then. And I couldn't, I was appalled when I found out that went on. Just like I'm appalled, and I understand we have codes, we have regulations, we have rules. You have to have rules for everything because otherwise everybody does what they want and the liability is harsh. Then somebody has to take responsibility for it. But this is not acceptable. Not acceptable, period. And I'm Thank not happy. You. Point of order, please. Thank Mayor. you. Yeah. Well, we, point of we, order, say what you want. Something needs to be order. done. All right. Point of order. I got commissioners. Commissioner, mine is just a request Comments. to the mayor and the TPO representative because Lake Helen Osteen is a county road. If you could bring it up at your meetings with them because I've been working and I'm asking the county to. I was going to do that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Alcadera. Yeah, I actually had a, uh, some comments related to um, some of the issues that have been shared, and I had them for the commissioner comments, but um, should I Well, I think we should, now? I th well, we could sit there and debate this. We don't do that under, you know, customer, you know, these kind of comments, but we ha I, I felt that I had to tell Ms. Golden that I did get that. I'm waiting to see the information back from the county, but we're trying to address the problem, I, and, I, and I agree with everything. And all, all I want to say said, is we want to make it better. We're going to work. And I think we all do, and all I want to say is that we shouldn't wait for the unified no, no. Uh, committee, and we shouldn't pass the buck onto the county. You know, we pay people a lot of money to run the city, and we should be able to handle these issues ourselves. The manager's working on it. She said okay. her comments Great. earlier. She's working on it now on a separate note, but that committee can help us in the future for more than just HVAC stuff. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, two issues, I'll address Ms. White's comments first. After that tragedy happened at Catalina and Lake Helen Osteen, I asked the manager uh, about sidewalks uh, on Lake Helen Osteen. Catalina already has a sidewalk. There's actually a school on Catalina uh, near the, uh, near the Winn-Dixie, I think it's a seven-day Adventist, so children do walk along Catalina. Um, that particular section of how, of uh, Lake Helen Osteen is owned by Volusia County and they have the responsibility for it. Um, I think, Jane, uh, we need to have a conversation with the manager. I personally would have no problem with us paying to put sidewalk along that section of Lake Helen Osteen, even though it's a county road, there are citizens. Um, we can do that through a memorandum of understanding, I believe, with the county. Uh, otherwise, we can formulate a plan to put it on a list with TPO and, and look at TPO dollars to do that. But the, And that intersection is a very difficult intersection because of the elevation and the curving and the banking that's there. Um, I have not seen the SO report to see if the sidewalk was or wasn't a contributing factor to that fatality. But when we came up with a sidewalk plan, when we first started talking about sidewalks, we said we were gonna do the list and we were gonna go forward with that. And I didn't want a citizen coming to this commission and bringing us information of an injury or a fatality because there was a lack of, of a sidewalk and that's exactly what's happened. Whether it's a county road or it's a city road, there are citizens, there are streets and we have an obligation to provide for the, the safety and welfare of those people. So. Let's look at getting that on the list and worried about whose road it is after we protect our people. Secondly, with regards to the, to the code issues. Everybody knows my former life was code administration for the fire end of the code. We had our difficulties with that. 
I had brought several months ago uh, to the manager. There is a provision in both the fire code and the building code in the administrative chapter for a board of adjustment and appeals. We do not have a board of adjustment and appeals that is needed. Um, whether we do that on a regional level or we do it within the city, you should have the ability to come before a list of professionals and both codes, both fire and building, outline who those people need to be on that board of adjustment and appeals. It's not just lay people, it's professional people, it's architects, engineers, they have to be residents. Um, and, and so that would, that would give us the ability for you to bring a complaint uh, if you felt you were being treated unfairly as you've brought to this commission. We're, we don't, we don't adopt that code. We don't have any, to my knowledge, we don't have any uh, local. I hate to keep point bordering there, but we're discussing things off of comments, on the, citizen yeah. comments that we're setting a precedent that we should have to off. do this every time now. Okay. I'm sorry, and he's making good I points. I understand. The, your points are well taken. Please go ahead and finish your well, comments. Well, I, I just would like this commission, if we need to set a workshop or something, uh, we, we, need to have, we need to have further discussion about the pros and cons of having a board of adjustment and appeals because the, the board you're talking about is, is basically uh, like they're gonna come up with formal interpretations for the region. Exactly. And, and that's not gonna solve these folks' well, Let's just, problem. your point's well taken, let's have staff look into that and see if there's something let's that we can set, set a up. workshop and we can have further well, discussion Well, let's let staff it. get some information about exactly how it's gonna work. In Thank that. you, Mayor. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bradford. And the reason I kind of wanted to, this was on my agenda to talk to you tonight, and if I have to leave, that's why I wanted to bring it up as well. I, I think having, I mean, it needs to be addressed right away, but I think we do need to have a workshop because it's not just HVAC, it's the electrical, it's the plumbers, it's the roofers, and I think that we need to have a consistency throughout. And if that means we need to sit down and have a workshop, and we were all up here saying, please, okay, let's do we've this. we've agreed on a workshop. I'm gonna cut you short, I'm sorry, but we've agreed we'll have a you workshop. You always cut that. me short. Well, I'm not, I'm not always, Because you're short, I'm, don't make me short. We, <laughs> that's because I'm short, I want you to show that you're I know, that. I know. All right, um, finish and there, and, and just to let you know, Brandy, I don't know if you want to attend, I know we're talking about doing the sidewalk up here, but I did get a notice today that the county is now having their meetings, they're gonna have one this Thursday morning and it starts at 9.30, and it might be a great time to go before them and ask them as well, can you help us with the sidewalk? So that'll be Thursday morning at 9 a.m. and I think they're in the Frank Bruno Chambers. Okay. okay, thank you. Commissioner Suka. First of all, apologize for coming in late. We yeah, I want. We were Second of all, going back to this topic, I know we're gonna do a thing, but if we could get a, yes. If we could get a comparison, either from Mr. Rowland or from the city manager on before the meeting, I would like to know how other cities are doing it. That's what, what they're doing, sir. Doing That's, you were, you, we talked about that earlier. That, okay. they, she's doing that now. Okay, all right, now we're gonna move along. Can, can we do this and set it up relatively quickly? We can't set a date because now, again, she's gotta gather the information. Off, pushing it off, Nobody's pushing, pushing, pushing off, nothing off, work. Commissioner, excuse me. No, I'm just We normally saying. don't even discuss items that are coming for us. I've done exactly what I promised them I would do. I, I, I'm as upset as everybody else, but I, but I support staff in what, in what they're trying to do, but it's apparently not getting between the two. And I'm just as upset as you are. I wanna see this work smoothly. There's no reason for these people have to come here. I mean, you know, we're paid to be here, not a great amount, but we're paid. But uh, the point is they shouldn't have to be here. They should be able to work these out differences and that's, that's the goal. So we're gonna move along with that. Uh, the next item on the agenda, well, a consent agenda, there's no items on the consent agenda tonight. And so we'll move into public ordinances and public hearings. Uh, it's a public hearing, pardon me? Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't make it to the pre-agenda meeting, but I noticed that Principal Pine just sitting out there. Is there any reason why yeah. we just can't move that bottom one up and get him in and out? Bottom one up. The Pine Ridge. Pine Ridge. These are both, yeah. these should yeah. both be very quick. Um, I, I understand that. Uh, Not the sign. Oh, the, okay. Yeah, I think it's gonna be, uh, it might be. Is there an objection by members of the commission to move on? Uh, it's it's a, it's item number eleven A. Eleven A. Eleven A. Let's do it. Uh, with no objections, uh, we, we're going to change the agenda. Bring item number eleven A. It, it's it's a simple. It's it's a request 
I guess the last line says it all, commission recommendation, new guidelines fund up to $1,000 out of our program. Is there any objection? No. Nope. Um, motion's in order, Vice Mayor. Mayor, I make a motion to approve the request for city funds to the Pine Ridge High School STEM program racing team. All right. In the amount. I'm sorry. I know we changed this to $1,000. Right, by action of the commission, right? This is such an extraordinary circumstance. They're the only ones in the state. My motion is for the full request the original request, I believe, was 2,500. Was that the original request? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my motion is for 2,500. I'll second that. Motion, but probably made and seconded to to. <clears throat> I don't know how I say this would be polite. To deviate from previously, we said we weren't going to do that, and the request has been made and properly seconded. Is there any discussion, uh, Mr. Honaker? Uh, yes, sir. And, I mean, that's my school. My stepkids go there. And the STEM program, I was, I was there for the green power. Love it. On the issue, They're doing sir. great things. This is on the issue. But I, you, ha you know how I am about setting a precedence. Now, every group that comes up, if one of the commissioners thinks this is really outstanding and it's different than everything else, let's deviate from the $1,000 that we set. And then we start running out of money. And uh, love it, principal. I love what they're doing. But... We've set a limit of $1,000, and I feel we should stay at that limit. In the words of Commissioner, Commissioner Bra Harvey, me. Commissioner Bradford, everything's permanent until we change so it. That's <laughs> right. That's right. I, I recommended them for the award. I mean, I was there, and I'm going to have to agree. We just voted that we, we had some great people come before us already and wanted 2500 and I know there's a lot more out there that are looking for that. And I can't support the 2,500. I mean, I think we need to kind of stay with that, that precedence that we stated. And I want you to know it has nothing to do. I think you are doing an exceptional job. I am so proud of those kids. But there's a lot more kids out there that need that, thousand, that other you know $1,000 as well. And thank you, Commissioner Sukup. Yeah, you know, this goes against everything that I believe. But I, I agree with both Mitch and, and, and Commissioner Bradford. RT, what you guys are doing over there is phenomenal, but we've had too many groups come up here that that I would love to give them five grand if we I could. Thought I'd try. I thought I'd try. I listen. I don't fault you. I don't fault the motion at all, but I just believe because of the the, the prior what we've done, the STEM program over here is phenomenal. It's only going to get bigger. We need to actually advertise this thing for them more and more. But there are a lot of other programs like this in the city, um, but. I, I'm going to have to stay to the thousand uh, as well, and that kills me. That kills me. I'm serious. Commissioner Alcatara. Um, I have to agree with uh, the commissioners, uh, my colleagues okay. here, um, and I graduated from Pine Ridge. Uh, uh, no, you'll hear uh, about that. But we need to be fair and equitable. We tell folks that we're going to set uh, a limit at $1,000, and we need to do that because we give the folks the impression that that's what we're doing. Um, I also want to say that if you guys have any fundraisers you guys are doing, maybe we can help. So if, if you have any fundraisers going on or if you need help putting on a fundraiser, uh, I think that we can uh, help you in that regard. All right, Commissioner Bradford. Chris, you just took what I said. I was just gonna say maybe there's a way that we can assist them with doing a fundraiser to help them bring funds in. I don't know if maybe we can even be like a co-sponsor for them to have a fundraiser and then you're gonna make a whole lot more than you know the $2,500. Okay, the motion on the floor is to increase it. Uh, you won't let the commissioners vote. Somebody. Who didn't vote? With the legislator, uh, Commissioner Sukup Somebody doesn't show up on there because he wasn't here at the present for the, so that takes him off the whole All system right. as far as voting, so we have to do a vote. Could you call a voice vote and get this over with? Commissioner Alcantara? No. Commissioner Bradford? No. Commissioner Hersberg? Yes. Commissioner Honaker? No. Commissioner Sukup? I'm sorry, no. Vice Mayor Nobick? Yes. Mayor Masarzy? No, motion fails. New motions are Commissioner Bradford. 
I would like to move to approve the request for city funds to the Pine Ridge High School STEM program racing team in the amount of $1,000. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Honecker, if you guys would remove your name, Vice Mayor. Okay, the motion been made and seconded to approve it for $1,000. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Does anyone oppose? Oh, wait, you want to vote? vote? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead and vote. vote. Now. Yes, we're back. It's Brian on. back on. Did you put Brian on there? Okay. Okay. All right, he's in. All uh, right. Everybody voted. Motion passed seven zero. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Heidi and Chris, you can take a check out to the school like I did today. After, uh, I'm sure the principal wouldn't turn down any cash cash donations. I took a check out the next day. So, anyway, to make a long story short, I agreed with you in heart, but uh, I didn't want to go against what we had done. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, all right, now we're back to ordinance number 9A. It's a public hearing, ordinance number 29, 2016. Amen, amending chapter 70-30, uh, definitions of chapter 102, signs of the land development code, it's second and final reading. Commissioners, before we get into this, Mr. Bowley's here. There is uh, probably a lot of ideas. Let's be short on words and, and uh, heavy on, on content and what we want to see changed. What's that? We would possibly like to request maybe to do item B first, so. Come on, what are you doing here? Because we have a lot this of questions. Gonna be a while. It's gonna be a while on the sign thing and to, and to have Mr. Watts and Mr. Hollow wait we be forever. Can we just do them, get that? Do B. Is there uh, any objection by members of the commission? Mr. Uh, Bowley, you can sit back down, it looks like. <laughs> well, it's not really, you're gonna be there anyway. Sorry. Is there any objections? All right. No. Contrary to the agenda we have before us, we're now gonna do 9B, public hearing ordinance number 352016, small scale future land use map amendment, CP 16001 for property located southeast corner, intersection Normandy and Saxon, second and final reading. Okay. So, comments by commissioners. Commissioner Honecker. No comments other than I'll make a motion. I hereby move to adopt ordinance number 35-2016, changing the future land use designation for two plus or minus 2.5 acres located at the southeast corner of the intersection of Normandy Boulevard and Saxon Boulevard from low density residential to commercial and transmit the ordinance to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity at second and final reading. All right, thank you, sir. Vice Mayor. Second. We're probably moving second. Commissioner Hertzberg. Oh, I was gonna second it or mo make the motion, but Could you take your name down then, ma'am? I'll take my name off. Commissioner Honecker. It's not going anywhere. You didn't withdraw it, neither one of you. Again? Commissioner Hertzberg, again. Okay, we, are we all, okay, now we're all upset. Or upset up. Okay, uh, are there any comments? Does anyone in the public wanna speak for or against this? Hearing none, we'll close the public comments. Uh, Mr. Fowler, if you'd read the ordinance, please. Can you be here with 35 to 2016? Board of the City of Deltona, Florida, pertaining to the comprehensive plan. Providing for a small scale future land use map amendment for nine parcels located at the southeast corner of the intersection of Saxon and Normandy Boulevards to change the future land use designation on said parcels to commercial from low density residential providing for conflict, severability, and an effective date. Thank you, sir. Would you allow us to vote, please? Most carry 7-0. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be Thank excused you, for a moment. Thank you, all. Thank you. We're looking Thanks forward to more businesses, guys. <laughs> okay, now we will finally get to Item 9A, which is a public hearing on Ordinance 29-2016, amending Chapter 70-30, regarding our sign code and the land development code. Mr. Bowley? I'll just briefly start off that in uh, 2015, there was a joint workshop between the City Commission and the D Deltona Business Alliance, the DBA, um, which directed staff to write an abbreviated uh, sign code down to maybe one or two pages, but that was not feasible. Uh, but we did get it down to seven pages. 
Um, and then uh, through 2015, putting it in the strategic plan to do this uh, through 2016, um, additional meetings with the DBA, uh, members of the DBA, and then in November of 2016, uh, being directed to uh, take it back to the DBA, uh, which we did so in January with major changes, um, which then sent it back to the Planning and Zoning Board, uh, which then um, came before you on March 6th, uh, 2017 for first reading, which then we were uh, remanded to send it back to the, uh, another meeting with the DBA, which occurred on March the 30th. Um, and then um, the meeting on March the 20th was tabled to date certain tonight for the second reading of the ordinance. So I'll be here if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bowley. Thank you. Commissioner Bradford. And I, and I do want to thank you guys very much, you and the DBA, for working on this sign ordinance. I know it's been a couple year process, and I just want to make sure that if it's done, it's done correctly. And, and understand that's why I'm doing this. I'm not doing it to pick on anybody. Um, I do have a concern with a 10 foot setback from my understanding, and I, and I get why you, you have it in there. But if we have a city right away, and the city right away is 10 foot, and then we add another 10 foot back, we're putting signs 20 foot at people's doorways. Um, I believe in. Uh, when the mayor comes back as well, we, um, the census is, is if it's on their property, there, there shouldn't be a problem with it under temporary or permanent. I know under section 102.1-11 and 102-2 number eight, both of them specify 10 foot back on their property. So it, it's not, it's from any property line. So if their property line is 20 foot back, the sign's now going 30 foot back. And to me, that's a grave concern. Um, I also feel that we need to make sure that we're doing a sign ordinance based on traffic ordinances and traffic analysis. There's also under table 1021, permanent sign height and sign area as measured by the city. We've pulled some numbers up there and I'm not quite sure where we got those numbers from. I would like to have some idea of where we got figures and numbers from and um, are those pretty unilateral to other cities and locations and states? Because I know there is a uniform sign code and there's also different states that, you know, it's not specifically, oh, this is the sign, because not one sign size and height is gonna be good for every area. Um, so what I would like to see is that there's a way that that 10 foot, I don't believe it should be from any, any ethical property line, but I, you know, once it's on their property, it's on their property, it's their choice where they put their sign. Well, as uh, mentioned before in the upstairs meeting, um, you can decide if you don't like the 10 feet, you know, you, as, the, as the governing board, you can decide if you want it five feet, you could put it zero foot, you know, zero foot setback right at the back of the uh, sidewalk, uh, or right on the property line. Um, but that is, if you have a sidewalk, you might have a sign foundation right here. That's a very urban design, not say that it isn't done, but in a suburban setting, there is usually is some kind of setback. So you can make it five feet if you is want. Is it to. normally like a two to five in your suburban settings or? Uh, it's, it, it could be anything you want, honestly. I mean, five was recommended by the DBA, 10 was put in there by the PNZ. We could go either way. It doesn't matter, uh, do you, whatever you decide. Okay, and then what about the sign sizes? I mean, where did we come up on, on in a table under 102-1? It says permanent sign height and sign areas measured by the city. And it has like monument signs, 10 foot, 80 square foot sign. I mean, some of these signs are, are huge and maybe too big for an area. And then you got other signs that may be little. So let's take like a McDonald's or Hardy signs. I mean, a lot of those signs have a standard size sign. So I mean, are all these gonna be going in for a variance? No, the, the the current sign code does not allow for a pole or, or our pylon signs. So the new version would. So that's why you get the greater height. Um, and this is a this is a standard and a table. Um, if you want an alternate, there is no variance process there. And the fact that we have that 102-11, which allows you uh, a flexible signage package, which you know whoever was building the sign would just present what they want to do and then it goes to one DRC meeting and then it comes in front of the commission. If you agree to it, then that it's final. Okay, so where, where did these figures come from? Was this just between research, the DBA and yeah, you guys? Yeah, just researching around different local codes in, in Central Florida 
to okay. have some levels of consistency. Okay, so what would we do now as far as getting it changed from five, from 10 foot to five foot? I mean, are you guys good with five foot, zero foot? Well, in I the think motion, zero foot's awful close. In the motion, then, you know, whatever changes are made tonight, you know, you put them in the motion and then we would have to change them here in the code. That's just my suggestion. I'd like to know what other commissioners think. All right. Okay, Commissioner Honecker. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, Chris, the DBA worked on this and we have a support letter as part of the packet. What was changed since there's DBA support letter? Okay, glad you asked. So I tried to make it easy and put it in a version attached mm -hmm. and I put a header up there on the very first page that says, note the areas that are shaded include changes recommended from the DPA based on most recent meetings with the city of Deltona. And that would have been the March 30th meeting. Um, Somewhere in the shuffle between the March 6th version and when um, uh, the Fowler firm was involved, two definitions were removed that had nothing to do with the DBA, they were put back in. Um, real estate signs, uh, at the meeting on March 30th, uh, it was discussed to take out the number of days from the actual definition uh, per um, research done by the city attorney um, and remove it from the actual definitions and put it in the language are the body of the code itself, not in the definition. So that was removed and I spelled that out. We put it in section 102-9. Under sign height, um, there was um, language added after used to measure the sign height. There was a sentence there, a sign will not be in violation of this section if its overall height exceeds the maximum allowable sign height. Under chapter 102, due to a natural change in the street grade or curb height from the previous 12 months. That was put in there because the DBA had some concerns about the measurement of the height of the sign, what the, what the measurement point was, what the methodology was for that. So that's why that was added. And then I put a note in here, note sign height definition was revised to address the measurement point in the period of time. So that's pretty clear. Um, then under table 102-1, permanent sign height and sign area is measured by the city. I put a note on top, the measurement point again, which was a concern by the DBA. Um, was put in both table 102 and 102.1 and 102.2. And that was added to the end of the monument and the pole pylon. Instead of saying um, from height of the grade, we put street grade or curb. They wanted that measurement listed uh, to be defined that way so that it wouldn't be confusing as they come forward with an application. Then on table 102, the same thing, under maximum sign height from street grade or curb, the measurement point. Then on your page 13 to 17 shaded, um, I put a note on there that the paragraph that starts with anyone desiring to make use of their site, mm -hmm. dot, 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 mm -hmm. uh, that was one paragraph with the next paragraph down. Um, the city shall not approve any application for a variance. So they wanted that separated. They wanted it split, and so I put a notation there that no new language was added. It was just merely a, par a paragraph break. So that's what we did for the DBA's request. Um, going on to section 102-9, exempt signs. Um, we talked about in the definitions 102-3 for you, then taking that 30-day language and moving it into here. The sign shall be removed within 30 calendar days after the event or its use. I put a notation in there for that. That was done um, for regulations because it's not really a definition, it's actual regulation. Um, let me go okay, on well to one or two dash That's nine. enough to, to make my point is they put a lot of time and effort into this. Have yes. we changed anything since they made those changes? No, sir. So what they put in there, because I, I didn't like the sign of the temporary signs on election day have only been a certain size, 18 by 24, I think it is. I might talk about that upstairs, but they put a lot of time and effort into this. I mean, if, if the commissioner wants to go five feet from the line, I don't think they would have an objective that since we're making it easier on them. And they wanted that originally. And they wanted that originally? Right. So that is a change. They it originally wanted back. five feet. So I could go along with five feet, but they put a lot of time and effort into this. They're the experts on it. We're elected residents, representing our residents. I do a lot of reading and research on this and try and be knowledgeable. But I have to take them at their word that they've spent this much time and effort that I'm withdrawing my change that I wanted to talk about upstairs and 
I think we should just go with what the DBA has did their letter of support for. And if we, you know, they said five feet, then great, go with five feet. Commissioner Sugup. Okay, uh, Mitch, don't, I, I agree. There's, a, there's been a lot of time, energy, and sweat in this thing since I've been here, and I know it was going on before I got to be a commissioner, but there's a couple buts. First one is a simple one. Um, have you ever been over to Port Orange? I have. Have you seen Atlantic High School? I have. You know what's on the front of Atlantic High School all over the fence? Banners. Okay. Okay. Now, my question is, in here in the exempt signs, you say banners located and maintained by public and private recreational facilities, parks, gymnasium, ball fields. Right. Can Deltona High School, Pine Ridge High School sell banners on the front of their street without being written up on this thing? Right, and keep in mind that the school board has their own set of signed standards. So well, it's super without a doubt, I'm just saying, does ours block it? But like, I'll use Trinity for okay. example. Those banners can stay on the outside of the ball field as, they as long are. as they're for this. As long as they are nice, neat, and and on the fence. Maintained. Okay. Yes, sir. That's the first one. Second of all, I, I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume that Mr. Kent's reached out or tried to reach out to most of us. I know I spoke with him. The concerns that he brings up, I, I got some concerns as well. Now, we keep saying that we're here for business. We want to open business. The racetrack sign that we signed, we, the variants came in front of us on Saxon Boulevard, right? Mm -hmm. um, what was the, uh, what's the word you use? Undo. In order to get um, a variance, it needs to be uh, hardship. Uh, undue hardship. What was the hardship used on that one? They were going for a larger signage. Okay, exactly my point. Listen, guys, we're here, we're here about businesses, right? We keep saying we want businesses to come in. We want to encourage business. I know that Mr. Kent is, is not associated with the, the DBA. That's not true. Uh, or, he is, or he is with the DBA, um, but he has issues with this. So he's not in the sign off that this copy is, is good. I think we all understand that he plans on bringing a couple fast food restaurants here to our city, where the signage is gonna need to be something that's not in here. My only question is, was there a variance uh, down there on the other racetrack for that big sign, um, down by Delton Boulevard? No, there was not. Why not there? They didn't request it. They didn't request one. Right. Is that sign in code? Yes. It is, so the, the, the parameters work. All right. Okay. So my question is, if, if, I, need a, if, I, need a, if I need a variance, right, I'm, I'm going to bring in a restaurant here to the city, but my sign is 85 square foot, okay? <laughs> let's just say, let's just say it's 85 square foot. I'm going to get blocked on that. No. No, sir. Well, um we thought it was a good recommendation by the DBA. They put in here this section 102-11 and they worked with the former city attorney on it. And um, the thought concept there was, as in a, a zoning application, you would have conventional zoning with set standards and you could also have a PUD type zoning. Why not do the same for signage? And that's what section 102-11 is. It keeps you out of the variance process. Now keep in mind, the variance is for uh, specific standards of which the current 102 is greatly larger and more cumbersome than this this seven page more flexible actually 14 with the definitions in it 14 page flexible version but you give yourself a non-variance flexible process in 102-11 by just taking it to the DRC for one meeting and then to the city commission for a final vote and the city commission can override the DRC if they so choose it's pretty straightforward. Okay. That, I just wanted to make sure the process and how quick it would be to come through. Right. And actually I, I don't want to block businesses if, it, if it's based on a sign height. We're not Lake Mary. Right. And the DBA actually had some changes to their own language. So um, they wanted it after the original language. They wanted specifically one DRC meeting and one <coughs> city commission hearing added. So we added that in. And that's basically in case it's blocking a view of something or in the way would be the only time it would... Well, let's say you have a sign contractor that you like, and I'm just saying just mm -hmm. hypothetically, and they have a certain sign style, and it doesn't necessarily comport to this. You just have them create a sign plan, bring it to the DRC, bring it to the commission, and go forward. It doesn't have to necessarily fall within the other standards of this, this sign code. Okay, thank you. 
Mr. Alcatara. I was going to say that um, we, we uh, Bradford and Honecker spoke about being okay with the five foot. I'm actually all right with, if it's on the property, make it simple. If it's on the property, it's allowed. You know, forget the five foot, 10 foot, the signs on the property, we should be uh, good with it. Okay. I, I agree with that as a, as a block, the sidewalk or right away. I, I don't, I'm not, nobody's going out there and measure it anyway. Commissioner Hertz, where are you against the floor? Thank you, Mayor. So, a few questions. Number one, in our previous sign code, we had no, we eliminated pole signs, correct? Uh, actually, the previous them? sign code and the one before that didn't have pole signs. So, pole signs were not allowed for That's several what I mean. years. Well, so, they're back now? Right, at the 2015 joint meeting with the DBA, uh, we had a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. and it was requested then to, to consider pole signs. So we put it in this version of the code. Do we have any requirements for landscaping for pole signs? Um, we're gonna work on a landscape, we're gonna update our landscape code and, and we'll address it then. Because um, there, what was the reason that we didn't approve pole signs, that we didn't want to have pole signs in the past? Actually, uh, Mr. Fowler might agree with me on this, but most communities are in, in the process of removing pole signs. Right, exactly, that's why I mean, I'm- It's I, the opposite. Hurricane. Th but that's then why are we putting them back in? Because that goes back to the 2015 joint meeting with the DBA here that said they wanted that was, But that was signs. two years ago. I mean- I, Well, this version has been out there for some time. Right, I, I guess my question to the rest of the commission is, why are we going with pole signs? Do they have hurricane regulations? Do they have anything that we- that are required by any of that Heidi, damage. One, one of the things they changed, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but right. one of the changes, they gotta be no less than eight inches in diameter now. They used to have four inch, yeah. three inch PVC and everything else. That that's This makes it more sturdy, more appropriate. I, I'm just not, not a big fan of pole signs, and, and I understand sometimes they're needed, and that's why, you know, and sometimes it's the best for the business, for the height, because obviously if you have something behind something, you're not gonna be able to, see the advertising for the business, so I understand the purpose, but I, I as, as a general rule, um, I'm not in favor of that. The next question I have is looking at um, banners, and I'm not, as, I'm not talking about over the road banners, I'm talking about the banners that you stick up, you know, like businesses have, they're cute, you know, the, the, flag? the flags, the fla flaggy things like that. Where in this, um, code do they fall under? Do they fall under 102-9 exempt signs? Yes, ma'am, they do. Under number four, banners, decorative flags, and bunting. As long as they're for a celebration, convention, and commemoration of significance to the entire community. Otherwise- and what's the time limit on that? There is no time limit on that. Okay, I have a big problem with that, too. I have a problem with not permitting that, even if there is no cost to the permit, and I have a problem with no time limit, and I'm gonna tell you why. Looking at sign codes from other cities, let's just take a take a look at you have a plaza. I don't care if you want to pick the Daltona Plaza or the, the plaza that Anytime Fitness is in or or anything. You gonna we have some businesses now that have three three flags outside advertising their business, those those flag bannery things. So there's no time limit that they can be up. There's no limit on the amount that they can put up, correct? Well, I was gonna say, if they are for commercial use, then they'd fall under the temporary sign process and there would be a time limit on that based on um, the temporary sign But it, does it say that in this, does it, under exempt signs, does it say banners? Uh, it, because it, there needs to be some clarification because if you're gonna go ahead and have five businesses in a plaza and everybody can put up a flag, unlimited amount of time, two or three at a time, that's an eyesore. A, it's an obstruction of the building, B, and that's not fair to whoever else isn't advertising, C. So there, I mean, I'm for them. I'm absolutely for signage. I think it's great, but we also have to have, if, if you don't have any type of a limitation and not permitting that, and it doesn't even matter if you don't have a cost to the permit, there has to be, if you're gonna do a permit within X amount of days, you know, that you can have it, two week time limit or something, there has to be some type of control, in my opinion, I'm only one person, over temporary signs 
and temporary advertising for businesses. I went through and I got the special event permit application for the city, just for example, the city of Ormond Beach. And it's a very, very simple one pager. Anybody can download it. It has special event banners, A-frame signs, it has fire burn permits, nonprofit organizational event, sidewalk sales, merchant tent, civic event, grand opening banner, and you just fill out this. It's a very, very simple, easy form, and it's consumer friendly, but it gives you an idea of what's out there and what's allowed and what's not. M like I said, my, my concern is no limitations on, what are the limits on the commercial signage? Like if you wanna, if you all have a new business and you wanna put up those, those banner signs. Well, um, flag signs. it says under, 102-5, temporary sign, time, place, and manner regulations, number one. Temporary sign use period shall be up to 100, 120 days per calendar year, okay. and the use defined in each sign permit, so you'd have to get a permit for that, temporary sign permit. At the end of the temporary sign use period listed in the permit, the sign shall be removed by the property owner slash sign owner. The city may exercise municipal processes to remove the temporary signage beyond the temporary sign use period. Okay, so if you're, if you're in a plaza and you're a business that's renting, it says um, the permit application shall be accompanied by written consent of the underlying landowner. Do they need landowner per landlord permission to do that then? Correct. And then um, sign shall not impede pedestrian or motorist safety as determined by the city. What determinations is the city using for that? Well, for example, like you know, going back to the permanent signage of the zero, uh, zero foot setback, um, there's a sign in the city that actually has a corner hanging out over a sidewalk and it's not on a lit street. So if you're riding your bike or you're walking, you don't see it, you'll catch the corner, you know. So it's, it's use of common sense more than anything to set the sign back a little bit so that somebody just doesn't run into it. Or if there's a recovery area where say somebody's coming one direction on a sidewalk and you're going the other, you don't veer off the sidewalk and into the sign and give yourself a little bit of room for recovery. Okay, and just one more question. The signs on vehicles parked in commercial areas, what does that fall under? Like when there's a car with like a billboard on it, parked somewhere forever and it doesn't work. Um, Is there anything about that in there? Yes, because uh, we tried to address all signage issues that we know about. I thought so, about. but I just didn't, I don't know where. It would probably be under 102-10 prohibited signs. Um, here it is. Under number nine of that vehicle lettering, graphic, magnetic signs on and operable vehicles or trailers or vehicles parked for advertising and not use as determined by the city. So in other words, you just pull a vehicle up, you put a sign on it, you leave it, and it stays there. Then the city would have the right to come by and, and notify you first to say, you know, it has to be an operable, operable vehicle. Um, you know, somebody has to make that decision. If you ask the, the vehicle owner several times, well then, you know, somebody has to have the ability to Okay, as long as it's happen. addressed. I know that that's, that's been um, right. an issue with some places. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Commissioner Bradford. Sorry to do this. Okay, under the variance, what constitutes them having to have a variance? They just come and say, hey, my sign doesn't fit into this side. I don't have to show any due hardship, no process whatsoever. I just get you dimensions, drawings. Now, a small business owner, they're not gonna be able to afford a lot of expensive drawings. So if I went and hand wrote and hand drew a drawing and it went before the DRC, or would I be required to have some more detailed expensive drawings in order to get my sign approved? Well, what do I have in, to go through? I'm an owner and I want a big sign. What do I have to do? Yeah, we, we put in there the word professionally, you know, somebody that can dimension off to scale um, a, a plan set, you know, so that it isn't just not to scale and just handwritten on a piece of paper, you know, and then it kind of defeats the purpose of setting your own dimensions uh, at that point. So professionally, and, and there are lots of sign contractors, high and low in range, you know, to select from. You don't always have to go with the higher end, you know. But I'm not gonna have to change all site plans and do all that kind of stuff for, right. for my sign variance. Right. And we, then- We purposely uh, left it open-ended, so it could be like that. It could be okay. that flexible. 
And then I know Heidi's concerned on the feather flags. I do know a business that I consulted for in Orlando. What they did is the feather flags that she's addressing, I believe, they allowed them, but what they made them do is bring them in at night. And the reason is, is they are awesome to hang around. They're a great thing to hide behind. Uh, police is driving by, I need to hide. Great little thing to, to camouflage. So I do know at night, Orange County actually makes them take them and bring them in every night. So I don't know if that's something that we would consider adding. I, I think the feather that flags, those oh, are the ones that flag. flop okay. around. Right. Yeah. In, the, in the discussion, Commissioner, you know, some one of the biggest issues are like even old sign frames with no copy face on them. So they're mm -hmm. not even a sign anymore, but the frames are there. And some of them are in the right of way. So, I mean, when you're talking about maintenance and use of signs, also just something small like taking out the old posts make all the difference in the world, you know. And if mm -hmm. it's removing the feather flags at night, um, I think it's more of a maintenance issue, uh, and, and there is a clustering issue like at, at uh, potentially at plazas, you know, where you have numerous tenants and all of them have a different flag. And, right, but they, also, they also become a, um, an easy device that can be used to break windows. True. So I've, I've seen a lot of things happen with those. You know, I actually worked for a company and they have been known to be picked up and thrown into plaza windows. So, you know, it's almost better in a safety issue, as I was saying, to have them removed on a nightly basis and brought back inside. So, I mean, that was a good catch, Heidi. Yeah, I, I, I like those signs. I mean, I think they're cool. Oh, I think they're cool and they do draw yeah. attention and it's important mm -hmm. for our business. Enforce it, it'll be a nightmare. Is that all you had, Yeah. Yeah, and I just wanna make sure we get that five foot instead of 10 foot on. Okay, Commissioner Sukup, sometime I wanna break in here when you all are through, but. I okay, real quick, I just simply Googled how important is signage for businesses, okay? And under lhsigns.com, here's the survey. Nearly 76% of all consumers, eight out of 10, said they had entered a store or business because that they had never visited before based on its signage. Mm -hmm. Nearly 75% indicated that they had told others about a business simply based on its signage. About 68% of consumers believe that business signage reflects the quality of its products or services. Um, about 67% of consumers surveyed said they had purchased a product or service because a sign caught their eye. Nearly 60% of consumers said the absence of signs deter them from entering a store or business. Roughly 60% of businesses reported that changing the design or enhancing the visibility of their signage had a positive impact on sales, number of transactions, and profits within an uh, average increase of about 10%. Over 50% of survey respondents indicated that poor signage um, deters them from enter, entering a place of business. Look, moral of the story here is we are preaching economic development. That's what we are preaching. We're preaching we need to grow businesses, we need to put businesses in here. Well, we need to make sure these businesses are successful, first and foremost. Um, we talked about, you just brought up poll signs. Listen, as a marketing guy, you want something that's gonna catch your eye. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been down 1792 where they put that new Chick-fil-A and look at the signs there. You can't barely see the sign until you get up to it. Um, up on the hill, you can't see it because it's a monument sign. You talked about shrubbery. When you put a monument sign in and don't put a pole under it, now what happens is that shrubs grow. Look throughout Deltona, uh, look through our city. You can go back to our city and see some of the shrubs that are blocking the signage. Um, second of all, temporary signs. Once again, I think we're nitpicking our businesses here. Um, I want to do whatever I can do to help a customer notice that a, bill, a business is in there. And if it takes those, those crazy things, or that, that blow up thing that's flopping all over the place, you know, so be it, that's ours. As long as it's nice, it's neat, well taken care of and secured, I think those are what we should be going after. My last question is to Mr. Baker, um, and you might be able to answer it to some probably simple yes or no question. First of all, have you read through this? It's your responsibility, your department's responsibility to enforce this, am I right? Is there anything inside of this that's gonna make you lose more hair than what you already have gone? <laughs> Can you please tell me what it is? 17 pages of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it brief, make it brief. I will say it's not as simple of an ordinance as it used to be, and I think the citizens are gonna have a tough time understanding it. However, I understand that it's also a legal issue why we had to change some of this. The example I'll give that you all fully understand are political signs. 
There used to be a section in the code that talked about political science. It spelled it out very neatly what you had to do. Now, we're gonna have to jump around. For example, in exempt signs, you can take your political signs and put them on people's property all day long, no permit required, nothing. However, there's a limitation on the size. If you wanna put a four by eight sheet of plywood up like you used to be able to do, now you're gonna go to another section of the code and you're gonna go get that sign permitted. So it's just simple things like that, but I also understand that there were some legal issues why we had to change some of this because we can't, we have to be content neutral, but there's gonna be a lot of growing pains going through simple things like that, but that's it. So the, so the number one issue that you have is it goes to the political signs? Well, no, I'm just using it as an example because I think everyone sitting up there understands political signs. We don't science. know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's just gonna be a lot of growing pains and that's why I'm gonna lose what I have left. Okay. But that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. But so, uh, summing up what I'm gonna have to say, guys, I just don't want to nitpick what we, what we want to let these guys do. Um, I would rather leave it um, vague and come back and amend it tighter um, than, than just start cramping everybody. We just had a bunch of AC contractors sitting over here off of one thing. Look, we want businesses in here. We want to let them know that we're here for their support. And if it's nice and neat, um, you know, I'm against a sign with four telephone poles that's hand painted. I don't need to tell you where that is, but that's something that, that I'm against. But if it's a nice, neat waving thing in the air that's just drawing attention to, to a sign shop, I'm, I'm in, guys, I'm in. And I just hope you guys are on the same board, so thank you. All right, Commissioner Hertzberg, Commissioner Honecker, and then I'm gonna speak. Okay, thank you, Mayor. So just, um, Commissioner Sukup, I agree with you. you, you your comments are absolutely true about signage drawing in business. However, a bad sign, a, you know, a dilapidated sign is a turnoff to go into that business. If you are gonna go there and, and, there's, and it's just, you know, ripped and bad and everything else, I'm gonna be like, well, if they can't even keep up their sign, what am I gonna find inside? So my goal only in the sign ordinance is whatever we do is to make it eye appealing for the businesses and for the residents so that it ups the level of our community and has and gets rid of the signs that are broken and torn and ripped and the ones that stand out there forever faded, the signs that never get taken down after an event is over forever and ever. That is what makes our city look bad. And I feel like it, you have to have a certain amount of rules and regula regulations to not allow that to happen. That's the only goal that I have, is that we have safe signage and we have signs that enhance not only the business, and the, but the city as a whole. And I think most of our proper businesses do that. Mr. Kent with his, his signs at Justin Square and his Burger King signs, they're an enhancement. They're not a detraction at all. And so many of the businesses that we have coming in do a great job of signage and promoting their business and you never wanna kill that. Um, so that's my only, my goal for this ordinance is to make it simple and easy for people to understand, easy to enforce as much as possible and keep it at a certain level that when they're bad, they have to come down. And just for the public's clarification, what Mr. Baker is talking about was a Supreme Court ruling that came down from the Supreme Court regarding signs. And it says it does not matter what is said on the sign. You have to have the same rules and regulations for that two by two sign, no matter if it's a political sign, a sign that is advertising your computer repair, or a sign that says we're having a Relay for Life event. It doesn't matter. That is the new rule. You can't say political signs of this size can do whatever. It, ha it has to be content neutral. And that's, and all the cities are reviewing their sign ordinances because they're improper according to what the Supreme Court said. So I think that's what you were referencing, right, Mr. Baker? That that's the, the, the difficulty. It's not Deltona. It's the fact that the Supreme Court did this nationwide to not have any issues with that, so. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Honecker. What? And I, I've heard all the discussions and I, I'm ready to make a motion with adding the zero I have on a property line. Okay, I haven't discussed any of mine stuff yet, but if you'd like well, to make a motion, a motion, you can go ahead. I can still bring it up. Um, yes, sir, I'm ready to make a motion. I hereby move to adopt ordinance number 
2.206, amending chapter 70-30 definitions in chapter 102, signs of the land development code with an amendment to sections 102-4, permanent signs, item number 11, and section 102-5, temporary signs, item number eight, to read all signs shall be located on the owner's property. Second. Mr. Graham, properly moved by Commissioner Honaker, second by Commissioner Alcantara. Now, okay, 104, and just so I understand your motion, and I don't bring it up if I agree with talking about it again, 104 point what? It's, it's 102-4, which is permanent signs, and item right. number 11 says the 10 feet. There's an item up before that on both of them that says they shall not impede right, traffic. Right, okay, okay, so you're, you're for, you suggested no, no footage, right? Yes, sir, on the, okay. on the owner's 102 property. 102-1. No, right. 102-4. Right. It's, it's one, just 102-1, table. item number, okay. Item number 11, and then 102-5 is the temporary signs where it also mentions, and that's item number eight. Right, okay. And change those to read, all signs shall be located on the owner's property. No. Okay, all right. Now. The motion's been probably made in second. I got a couple of questions. I, I, I agree with those, but I, I do have a couple of questions here. Political signs, uh, all of us have obviously ran for political office. We are required by uh, the state to have certain things on and off our signs. If a resident wants to put a sign in their yard without paid political advertisement or whatever the current rules will be at the next election, uh, that is a uh, responsibility of then who? You're not gonna enforce that if it's on a private property. So it, so I'm just saying this, this happened years ago. <laughs> Larry will know what I'm talking about. But if a private individual puts a sign in their yard, an opinion sign, I support Jimmy Jones or whatever his name is, uh, that absolutely doesn't fall with anything here at all. They can do a standard size 18 by 24 sign and, and it would be between the uh, supervisor or lecturers or our, our clerk and the, the candidate. Okay, I wanted to make sure that was, everybody understood that. Some of the problem I have is this one thing, and maybe you can tell me that, you got window etching. Now I understand etching to be actually carving in the glass type etching, is that what you mean? What about, what about lettering in the window? Because in here on one spot you say 50% and I'm 102.1, down under type, sign type, you've got window etching, 50% of the copy, then later on it's, it's mentioned somewhere else in there, mentions 25% temporary window signs should be limited to 25%. Um, are you speaking etching, meaning only etching, which is very seldom ever used, it's very expensive. It's right. usually done for decorative and, purposes, and it and could not be signs. lettering. Um, and it could be lettering, the etching is what you're speaking of, any kind of, um, any kind of a, a mark in a, a see-through glass window. Yes, sir, and, and okay. the distinction here is part of this code, not only the content neutral and the time, place, and manner requirements that Dale mentioned, but you know, is to make a clear distinction between permanent signage and temporary signage, because oftentimes temporary signage morphs into permanent signage. So, so you want to keep the temporary at 25%. Right. And let the permanent go up to 50. Right, and that was discussed with the DBA in the January meetings, um, and the 25% for the temporary, and that also was uh, addressed with the VCSO, um, and they were the ones actually that gave us the language for well, no, the I, You don't need to look it up. I just oh. want to make sure that's what you want. Here's my question. Yes, sir. Window, uh, business window, side of the building, not the front of the building, side of the building, bunch of letterings on there does not exceed 50, probably no permit at all. They just put lettering in the window. Right. Is that illegal? Uh, no, that would not be illegal. I so mean, it's, it's legal to put per window. plastic letters in a window. Right, a temporary version, uh, which would be the stick on, you know, stick like, on. like you'd find at a convenience store, yeah. I'd say, you know, that's 25% of the- Or even if copyright. it's painted on with shoe polish and it could be washed off it, but they put it up, there's no requirement for permits or nothing, they just right. do it, right? Okay. Yeah. All right, I wanted to know that one. That doesn't affect the thing. Um, I'm okay with that. Uh, okay, I also, I, I would like to see, and I don't know how the commission feels about this as me and I look through this, I don't like to see signs in a right-of-way by anybody. Not the city of Deltona, not 
private organizations, nobody. I don't think we should open our right of ways up to anybody for signage at any time. I know we've in the past done it, and because we did it, then we opened it up somebody else. They are our rights away. Can we not just disallow signs in the right of way? You can, Period. because they're your rights of way. Is there anybody that agrees with me on that? I don't, I don't think I we agree. should have signs in the right of way. I, I, I think, think they're dangerous, and I think that it just goes wholesale. There's no way to control it, and Code of Works got to pick them up all the time. It depends on the type of signs, and I'll just use it. I'm example. just saying any sign in our right of way, if it's not approved by the city for city business, that's, it's I'm going right away. That's what I mean. Like if the county had a. Well, no, I, I meant traffic signs. Traffic signs, not not parties and events. Right. Like no event signs, no signs in the right of way at all. Period. And, and some of them that code enforcement typically runs across are garage sale directional signs or, or signs for a master plan subdivision for leading you to the model row, things like that. that those, are, are, those are safety issues or movement of issues. That's, that's different, but they, they don't need to be in the right of way anyway without well, that, they can get a permit. Right. They would, and they take them down. They would be able to get a permit in here to do that that's and then they'd different. have to remove them. Okay. Okay. The only, the only other one. Uh, Nope, that's it. Okay. Motion been made and seconded. Vice Mayor, you got comments before we vote? Yeah. Um, I know a lot of hard work has gone into this. It, it, it's, I still can't support it. It, it is, um, some of the stuff in here to me is just absolutely ridiculous. Why? Why would you allow something for a business on a temporary basis? It's either okay to be there on Monday through, through Friday, or it's not. To say something is temporary, that you can only have it on the weekends, or you can only have it for 30 days, um, you know, if you're gonna advertise a grand opening, I understand that's a grand opening, 30 days. But then, let's just say on these store windows, you have a vendor that comes in and puts up a holiday holiday signage on the, on the window for 4th of July. Okay, that's temporary. Till the next holiday comes, the next week. And then 